Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. For the past few weeks, we've been spending a Sabbath day with Jesus. It began at the Pharisee's house where Jesus had been invited to a supper with the Pharisee and other invited guests. It moved on out into the streets where the multitudes began to surround Jesus and he gave to them a very severe and harsh terms of discipleship. If you want to be my disciple, your love for me must exceed all other loves of your life. You've got to put your love for me above your love for your family, those dearest ones in your family. If you want to be my disciple, you've got to submit yourself totally unto the will of God. You must take up your cross and come after me. And finally, In order to be his disciple, you've really got to forsake all. Now, after laying out the terms of discipleship, verse 1 of chapter 15, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and the sinners to hear him. It is interesting to me that when Jesus laid out these strict terms of discipleship, rather than driving the people away, it drew the publicans and the sinners. You would think when he laid out such severe terms and the cost of discipleship, that men would have shuddered and thought, well, that was a good idea, but... Uh, for someone else, not me. But there drew unto him at this point a multitude, a crowd of sinners, publicans, in order to hear him. Somehow we feel that it's important that we make the gospel rather palatable and acceptable to men sort of sugarcoat uh, the gospel. Uh, you know, just, uh, there's a lot of, well, just do your own thing but believe in Jesus. You know, don't need to alter your lifestyle. You can just, you know, go ahead and continue doing your own thing, but the important thing is just to believe in Jesus. But Jesus, when he laid out the cost of discipleship, was very severe. He laid very heavy requirements upon them. Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. It drew the sinners. And when the Pharisees and the scribes saw the publicans and sinners mixing with Jesus or Jesus mixing with them. They murmured saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. A lot of times we learn about Jesus not from just his friends but from his enemies. And his enemies declared of him, he receiveth sinners. They don't know what a blessing that is to me. 
They don't know how happy that makes me feel that Jesus received sinners. Because that means that there is room for me. If Jesus receives sinners, then that puts me in. It makes him available. It means that I can touch him. He receiveth sinners. If he didn't receive sinners, where would any of us be tonight? But that was a complaint that they had. They were murmuring while well, he receives sinners and he eats with them. You see, the Pharisees had very strict rules concerning righteousness. And they would not mix with sinners. When a Pharisee would walk down the street, he would take his robe and would wrap it tight around himself so that it wouldn't swish out. He didn't want his robe swishing out and touching a sinner lest he might become defiled. And so they, they had this very uh, strict kind of separation between themselves and the common person. I don't want anybody to touch me and I don't want my robes touching anybody. And, and here's Jesus and he's out there, you know, slapping the sinners on the back and they're touching him and all. And, and, and it upset the Pharisees who had this very strict rule of, of, of regimen, don't touch them, you know, you might be defiled by just touching them. And to see Jesus mixing freely with them disturbed them. But he went one step beyond that. He's even eating with them. Some fellow maybe had a piece of bread and, you know, he offered Jesus some and Jesus pulled some off and ate it and the crowd was pulling off the bread and eating it. He's eating with sinners. Now we have mentioned before concerning the cultural aspects of eating with someone in that particular culture. To eat with someone meant that you actually became a part of that person and they became a part of you. Because you're eating from the same loaf of bread. We're both being nourished by the same bread. It's assimilating into my body, becoming a part of me. It's assimilating into your body, becoming a part of you. So we are becoming a part of each other. There is a mystical bond between us now because we are, have eaten of the same bread and thus we are bound together in this mystical bond with each other. And they looked upon eating with people as creating that mystical bond. And Jesus is shocking them. He's touching the sinners. They're touching him. He's even eating with them. Did you see that? Took a bite of that bread. Can you believe that, you know? And, and so they are murmuring because of Jesus mixing so freely with the sinners and the publicans. And so, he spoke this parable unto them. So notice that this parable is addressed to the Pharisees. Now, notice it says this parable singular. Many people look at this as three parables but it is a parable with three parts. There are three parts to this story he's about to tell. In the first part, there's a lost sheep. In the second part, there's a lost coin. And in the third part, there's a lost 
son. So the similar pattern that is woven here in this parable is that in each part of the parable, something that is valuable has been lost. In each part of the parable, the natural response to finding something that has been lost is rejoicing. When the shepherd finds the lost sheep, he throws it over his shoulder and he rejoices. And he calls for his friends to come and to rejoice with him because he found the sheep that was lost. When the woman finds her lost coin, she rejoices. And she calls her friends to come and rejoice with her because she found her lost coin. When the lost son returns to the father, the father rejoices because this my son who was lost is found. And so in each part of the parable, not only something of value was lost, but the natural result of finding something that is lost is to rejoice. Some people see in the three parts to this parable the Trinity. In the first part of the parable, it is the Son, the Good Shepherd, who goes out and seeks the lost sheep. In the woman finding the lost coin, they see the Holy Spirit going out to draw the lost into the Father. And of course, in the third part, the lost son, they see the Father, God the Father, rejoicing over the salvation of the lost son. This parable brings comfort to both the Calvinist and the Arminianist. The Calvinist takes comfort that in the first two parts of the parable, that which was lost was sought. The shepherd sought the lost sheep until he found it. The woman sought the lost coin until she found it. And so the Calvinists find great comfort because of the sovereignty of God in seeking the lost. It is God who seeks the lost. The Armenians, however, also find comfort in the parable because it is the son who finds himself and says, I'm going to return to my father. And so the human responsibility when the son had had his fill of the uh, living in the pigsty, uh, he decided he was going to go back home to his dad. And so the human responsibility of the son in the third part of the parable. The parable teaches, first of all, that heaven rejoices over the lost being found. In the case of the shepherd, verse 7, Jesus said, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. So this first part of the story, the shepherd seeking the lost sheep, is bringing us, when the rejoicing of the lost has been found, bringing us then a view of the heavenly scene, the rejoicing that goes on in heaven over the one who comes to repentance more so than over the 99 just persons which need no repentance. 
In the case of the woman who had lost the coin, verse 10, likewise, as he is applying it now, likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. So every time a sinner repents, every time the lost has been found, there's a celebration in heaven. The angels of God rejoicing over the fact that that lost one has been found, has come back into the fold. The glorious rejoicing in heaven. Heaven is far more aware, I'm certain, of our earthly things than what we are aware of. The Bible says concerning this glorious salvation that we have and this Christ in us as our hope of glory, which things even the angels desired to look into. It's, it's a heaven is watching and rejoicing over the lost being found. But in the third part of this story, we are introduced to an older brother. And his reaction to the lost being found, as it is in such sharp contrast to the natural reactions. Rather than rejoicing, it says, he was angry. So let's look at the third part of the parable, the part which has become so familiar, the parable of the lost son. A certain man had two sons, Jesus said. The younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the portions of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto him his inheritance, his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered everything together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would have fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave him anything. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have enough bread and more than enough? They have some to spare. And I'm perishing with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm no more worthy to be called your son, but I would like to be one of your hired servants. I'd like a job. And so he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Beautiful picture, glorious literature. And of course in it we see A tremendous picture of God's 
love and God's concern for the errant son, the one that's wasted his life in riotous living. Notice he ended up in the feeding the pigs, trying to fill himself with the husk that he was feeding the pigs. He had to get to the bottom before he came to himself. Therein is an interesting lesson of life. So many times, unfortunately, people have to get to the bottom before they come to themselves, and thus I feel that many times we hinder and thwart the work of God in a person's life. A lot of times we become enablers. We help the person to maintain. They couldn't live the way they are living unless we were enabling them to live that way. And so we think we're helping, but in reality we're hurting them. They don't know the true consequences of that lifestyle that they've adopted because we don't let them experience the real bitterness of the cup they've chosen to drink. Now, when the son headed home, he no doubt just left the pigs and started back. His robes were probably still pretty smelly. Smelled of the pigs. The pigs died. He was probably pretty filthy. And yet what did the father do? He didn't say, get a bath and get some clean clothes on, you know. But he fell on his neck and kissed him. He touched him. He mixed freely with him. Even as Jesus was touching those people who in the minds of the Pharisees were unclean. They were finding fault with Jesus because he was mixing with them. He was touching them. They were touching him. They were murmuring against him. He's mixing with sinners and publicans. So comes now the elder son. And he was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. And he called one of the servants and he said, What in the world's going on? What's happening? And the servant answered, Your brother is come. And your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry. He would not go in. And therefore his father came out and entreated him. And he answered his father and said, Look, these many years I've served you. I've not transgressed at any time your commandments and yet you never gave me a kid that I may make merry with my friends but as soon as this your son was come which has devoured your living with prostitutes you've killed for him the fatted calf the older son was angry he was jealous he was upset Upset that his father would receive the younger brother with such a celebration. Upset that the father would have a party and kill the fatted calf. I've done my best to keep your law. I've tried to keep your commandments. You never had any big celebration for me. Yet this rotten brother of mine spent everything he had on wild women and all and look what you do. 
And in this, Jesus is painting for the Pharisees a graphic picture of their attitude. You see, the whole parable was directed against the Pharisees and against their attitude back in verse 1 as they were murmuring against him because he received sinners, or verse 2, he was receiving sinners and eating with them. They were murmuring against him for that. They were angry. They were upset. Look at him out there receiving those sinners, you know, mixing with them. And so the purpose of the parables or the parable is to show that their position of anger over what Jesus was doing was wrong. The natural thing when the lost are being found or the lost are being saved, the natural thing is to rejoice. Heaven rejoices. And if you're not rejoicing in what's happening, you're out of harmony with heaven. You're not in tune with the heavenly things. Heaven is rejoicing because the lost is found. The lost are coming to Christ. Sinners and publicans are gathering around him. He's receiving them. And the Pharisees should have been rejoicing that God was at work. To bring it to a present day kind of an application, One of the problems in the church today lies in the many denominations which in reality are sort of walls that we build up around ourselves to keep others out unless you look like us and think like us and act like us, stay home. We don't want you. The walls are built up to divide the body of Christ. The tragic byproduct of that is that if God should see fit to bless the Baptist church and give them a tremendous revival that would begin to shake the city. We are prone to say, but it's a shame that it happened in the Baptist church, isn't it? or if it would happen in the Presbyterian church or in the Methodist church. Rather than rejoicing that God is moving, our community is being stirred, people are being saved, we must be careful that we not have the Pharisaic attitude and say, well, you know, it should have happened here. You know, we're more dedicated than they are. And it's very easy to get that Pharisaic attitude if it isn't happening to us, if it's happening to them instead of us. I wonder how many are really saved, you know. <laughs> Cheap salvation they're offering over there. No wonder so many are going, you know. <laughs> A lot of sour apples within the church. A lot of that Pharisaic kind of an attitude in reality it shouldn't make any difference to us 
what church it is happening in, if it's happening, that God is working and souls are being saved and there's a tremendous move of God and people are coming to Christ, we should rejoice. If we want to be in he harmony with heaven, we must rejoice. And if you find yourself sour apples, the work of God, because it isn't in our church, but some other church, then you really are out of harmony with God. And so it's easy for us to take a Pharisaic attitude towards the work of God today. And the parable was intended against the Pharisees to show them how wrong their murmuring was in their accusation against Jesus. And so the father said to the older son, Son, you are ever with me, and all that I have is yours. But it was necessary that we should make merry and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Heaven rejoices when those who are spiritually dead come alive, when those who are spiritually lost are found. It is interesting. In the parable, both the Calvinist and the Arminianist are correct. The Lord does seek after the lost. Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. And God seeks after the lost. But it is also true that a lot of times God allows us to get into such hopeless, desperate straits that we come to the end of ourselves and we come to our senses and we begin to seek God. And it really doesn't matter which way it is working. What really matters is that we come. Rather, whether, whether sought out of God or seeking God out really makes no difference. The real issue is that we come and be saved. That the sinners realize that God is seeking the lost and rejoices when they are found. And if you come to the awareness that you're lost and you turn to God, I love the picture of the father. He doesn't wait for the son to get there. He runs out and meets him on the road. I love that. God won't meet you halfway. He'll meet you more than halfway. The father had been watching. He'd been waiting. As soon as he saw the son returning, he ran to meet him, fell on his neck, kissed him. And so God's love and receiving and God's receptivity to the lost. And Jesus was only demonstrating that. You see, later on, When Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and it will satisfy us, Jesus said, have I been so long a time with you and yet have you not seen me? Don't you realize if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? And in seeing Jesus mixing with the needy people, bringing with his touch hope and life, you see the plan and the purpose of God for man who is lost in sin. Know this, <laughs> he receives sinners. He'll even eat with them. He'll receive us and bring us into that most intimate fellowship. So we pray. Lord, we're so thankful that you do receive sinners and that you wash them and cleanse them. You put on the new robe, that robe of righteousness. 
to celebrate. Thank you, God, for the great celebration. The lost is found. Lord, help us that we will not be as the Pharisees who found fault with you because you didn't do it the way they thought you should, who murmured because you went out from their supper and you ate with the sinners. Lord, help us. that we might be busy in seeking the lost and rejoicing when they are found. In Jesus' name, amen.